what I'm gonna what I'm gonna try and do over the next couple times that I'm in the pulpit, um, I shared with you last time that uh, as we take a look at the blessing, this covenant blessing thing that uh, we have access to is the blessing. It's known to us kind of as the blessing of Abraham which as, you, as we talked about that, it's actually the blessing of Adam, which was passed on to, the, to Noah, which was then passed on to Abraham, which then became available to Jesus, through Jesus, uh, to us. And we, could, we were grafted then into this river of covenant blessing that God had always intended that humankind would live in. And we can notice then that as God describes these things and pronounces blessing on people like Noah or Abraham and these type of things, that it's always in covenant talk. Uh, you know, like the Lamb of God, Jesus, was our access in because of the Lamb being slain, we have access to the covenant that was established and running for thousands of years. And so we might think of that, that we came up with this cool idea of the Lamb of God being Jesus, but that is referencing uh, the covenant sacrifice the, that was made as part of the Old Testament, as you might have seen that with, you know, different things that you're watching back there in the Old Testament with, you know, kind of sacrificing animals and all this kind of what we would call gross stuff. But uh, back in the day, that was how you, you know, chickens didn't come from the supermarket back then, they came from the ax. So, the, the way the world operated was, uh, was very much invested into this slaying of animals thing and sacrifices and covenants and these type of activities, which are very, very strange to us in modern times, but in, in olden times, we're not strange at all. And so what, I, what I'd like to be able to do, because I'm becoming aware, even for myself, going through all the studying of this blessing of Abraham thing, that unless you have an understanding of the covenant, uh, you can't just go after the blessing. Let me say it to you like that. I know in our world, you, you, know, you can go after the blessings of being married without being married. Um, and that's kind of normal place for us. But that's not actually the way it's supposed to be. And certainly in the, the, the environment with God, if you want to be a partaker of the blessings, the blessing isn't accessible just on its own. That's kind of the message that comes through. Noah gets off, the, gets off the ark. He sacrifices, makes a covenant with God, and out of that covenant comes God saying, okay, you're, I will bless you, and here's how I'm going to bless you. And then Abraham, he kind of does the same kind of activity with that, that scene that, you know, when God is cutting a covenant with Abraham where he comes down and, you know, the fiery pots, and he cuts the animals, and they walk back and forth between the animals in the muck that is created there. And so there's a covenant that is being cut, and then out of that covenant, the blessings are come out of that. And so uh, what we have to do is, uh, let me say it to you like this, let me flip it upside down. It's going to be normal for us in our culture to want to get the things, the blessings of the covenant without actually doing the covenant part, without understanding what the covenant part actually is. But can I tell you, there's no cheating this system. Right. If there was a way to cheat this system, I can absolutely tell you I would have found it. Because uh, God, who is the mediator of this covenant, is very interested in the covenant side of it. The blessing side of it is sort of like the outflow, or it's like being married. You need to be really interested in being married to your spouse. If you're really focused on just the blessings of getting a hot cup of coffee and, a, and, a, and eggs and toast in the morning and maybe some of the other benefits and that's all you're focused on, but you leave the person out of your emotions and out of your life, how many of you could say that's, that relationship's not going to last a whole long time? That's the same kind of principle that is applied here when it comes to the covenant. And when we try to understand covenant in our culture, we literally have no basis for understanding a covenant. We almost do nothing in our culture based on a covenant. Even marriages and those things which are covenants, we kinda don't really, you know, we're not really strong on our understanding of what all of this means. And so in our journey for this, this, this Gregorian calendar year, <laughs> Uh, to really lay hold of what is it going to take for these blessings of Abraham, which we've been hearing about probably all of your Christian life, 
to really have those things accessible and flowing in our lives in, in a normal, natural kind of way. What we have to do is go back and figure out this thing called covenant and really decide, am I, is, is there evidence in my life that I'm actually flowing in the covenant with God? Or am I just doing the North American thing, uh, which we're gonna discuss, maybe not tonight, but as we go forward, uh, we do the North American thing and try to say that's covenant. And, and God is saying, yeah, you know, no, that's, uh, that's not it at all. And we're not gonna really talk about the blessings. We're not gonna talk about how the flow goes in your life because I remember the Lord said this to me early on in our game. He said, Ian, if, if I'd bless you, you'd leave me. You know, could you imagine you waking up in your prayer time and, and God saying that to you? Because I'm busy, you know, yelling at him because he's not blessing me well enough. And he tells me, if, you know, if I blessed you the way you're asking me to bless you, then you would just take off with the blessing. You wouldn't, not, you're not really here for me, was the kind of the underlying message, uh, you know. And so it was clear to me that God is, was, God's a lot more interested in having a relationship with me than he is blessing me. Although, if he has a relationship with me, he wants to bless me. Does that make sense to everybody? So what we have to do then is we're going to have to go and spend a little bit of time picking apart what is a covenant and how do you and I really get the, the cultural understanding of a covenant when we weren't raised in a covenant society. Yes. Uh, that's not going to be easy for us. Let's start with that. At least that's what I've discovered right? My journey, as Pastor Tina kind of mentioned a little bit there, sort of underneath the praise report was we were business people before the Lord called us into ministry. And so I was really well trained. I, I tell people I, was, I spent 25 years in the, in the Mammon University, and I was an A student learning how to make really good partnership with Mammon. And because that's all I understood. I did, I, you know, I was raised sort of in a godly way, but there was no power in that way. There was no, you know, real strength in that way. It was just a religious expression of what you did. If you want to go change the world, then you need, you know, the do re mi in order to change the world. You needed to know how to do things. You needed to know how to compete. You needed to know how to negotiate. You needed to know how to, how to, how to, how to, how to, how to. And all of those things then, when you come into the Lord, and now you're trying to flip that upside down, really quite blindsided by God's expectations. And we have not done a very good job, certainly over the last three or 400 years, of you know, making the process of joining Christianity very um, business-like. Uh, you know, here's the deal. Uh, you're going to go to hell if you don't get up here and pray this prayer. And if you do pray this prayer, then you're gonna to get to heaven forever and ever and ever. And that's a, good, that's a pretty good deal, right? Who wouldn't take the deal? It costs you nothing, pray a prayer, secure the whole thing. That's easy, if you're a business person, you're saying that's all it costs to get eternity in heaven, deal. Show me the prayer, I'll pray away. Instead of it being, now you're going to enter into a covenant. That's why we focus here, we get in trouble here sometimes about not having you know, crazy, aggressive altar calls all the time. We have those environments where people are given that opportunity all the time to make a commitment to the Lord. But, you know, you make a commitment too quickly. How many of you would get married to somebody you met yesterday? No. Nobody would do that. How about somebody who I told you about <laughs> 10 minutes ago? Right? You wouldn't do that. But we want people to come and have a covenant experience with Almighty God, right. a God who a minute ago they didn't even know existed. Very good. Wow. And now you want them to come in and have a covenant relationship and really have the wisdom and understanding of what commitment they are actually wow. making when it comes to this thing called Christianity. Yeah. Was never intended that you know, access into this was going to be kind of like pay your 25 cents at the door and now you're in and you're in for life. That was never God's intention with this. And we just did that because it worked well from a marketing standpoint. The problem being many people, uh, us, may be here and still trying to negotiate with God based on a North American, you know, the art of negotiation kind of a thing. It doesn't work like that. 
uh, it needs to be something that we can have an honest season with and say, okay, God, am I really in this kind of a relationship with you? And what we're going to try and do in the journey is because we're all going to be woefully out of our depth when it comes to trying to understand covenant, what I'm going to try to do is I'm tr- going to try and relate it to the closest we ever get to a covenant, which, which is a, an actual covenant, but maybe we don't understand it as well, is a marriage relationship. And we're going to make, draw a lot of parallels between a natural marriage relationship and how that works and becomes life-giving. And then looking at now from that experience, how do we create the right kind of relationship with our heavenly father and make the same kind of decisions in order to put our soul in a place where we're ready, we're, is ready a good word? We are prepared and maturely entering into this huge commitment that's called a covenant with Almighty God. You know, he challenged me. I'll just give you a little bit of a story. Uh, he challenged me. I think it was Michael who was talking about it. Um, was it Michael or somebody else? Anyway, somebody was talking about when they were young, they witnessed two of their family members enter into a blood covenant. Now, I've never seen that. I've never had somebody, you know, like in the, you know, the way we, those kind of cut your hand and you put your hands together and you make a covenant together. And that has, that imagery has really stuck with me. And I can, because I'm kind of looking at it, you know, what would I, when would I do that? Maybe you could ask yourself that question. Who in your life would you have a blood covenant with? Like a, like a brother. And I, the imagery that came to me was two POW, you know, two warriors, two army guys. And they covenant together and they say, I'll never betray you. And you'll never betray me. If we're captured, we're not giving away the information. We're not, you know, no matter what. And we covenant together to do that. And now both of us are captured and they put us in separate rooms and they keep telling us that, you know, he would tell the, 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 the baddie, whoever, the baddie, the other guy, the other team, would, who would always be the baddie, of course, since we're always on the right side of every argument. Um, but uh, he would keep telling me that Garth betrayed me. Well, yeah. when, that's what they would do. They tortured us. They said, no, he already, gave, he already gave you up. What would I think about at that point? Well, I don't know if I would think that, right? I would think, I would think you would think that of me, but I don't know if I would think that of you, right? I mean, they're torturing him really badly. And he's just not giving up the information. Would I trust that he would not, he would die before he would give up that information? You see the depth of this? It's, it's, and it's real because if, you know, I'm going to, if he already gave up the information, I'll give up my information. That's what I'm thinking, right? But if I know he would never do that, not just never do it like he's a shucks, he's a good guy, but under no circumstances ever would Garth, he'll die and he would be tortured to death before he would betray the covenant agreement that we have with each other. Imagine who you would be ready to make a covenant like that with. You see how, now, and think about it, it's like, wow, I wouldn't do that with anybody. You see, you see the problem? Right. Is that we have, we, that's how the world worked before. You had to honestly be ready to take on another tribe or another whatever. You know, they would make all these arrangements and all that. And they would have to assess the whole process because I'm going to be ready. To, I need to be ready to fulfill my side of the agreement. And I need to trust right. that you are going to be that committed to me. Amen. Think about like. That's, that, that, there's a depth to that character level of things for me to be ready to put that kind of a trust in another person. That's why these things were like, they were the biggest things that ever went on was when two men, whatever, two families decided to covenant together. It was the biggest deal of an entire lifetime to say two people were ready to do that. Instead, um, our culture doesn't run by covenants. Even though we use that terminology, we really don't mean it the same way that they did back then. It's a legal word now that refers to an agreement. Um, But our world runs by laws and the judicious implementation of those laws. 
And that's very different than a covenant world. A covenant world, I need to trust the other person. In our world, we need to trust the system, right? And so let's go back. Sandy and I were in agreement together and he was going to paint my house and I was going to pay him. And then he didn't paint the house the way I wanted it to pay. I wanted it blue and he painted it pink and then I didn't want to pay him. Now we have this disagreement in what happened. So he's going to say, well, no, no, you picked the paint and you said it was pink. You see, I just painted what paint you got me and I didn't know you. On and on and on, the, you all can see where the argument will go. And we can't come to terms with one another. I don't have to trust him or not trust him. What do I do? I hire a lawyer, right? And I take him to court and I let the legal system and the rights and the wrongs and who, the paperwork and who signed and what did you do and when did you do it and all of this legal you know, process. And then these people, the, the legal system figures out how we should solve our problem. That's how our world works. The problem with that is we have never had any necessity really to trust another person right? At best, we are trusting maybe that he's got a certificate that says he's a painter. So he went to painter school. And so I want to see his certificate that says he's been to painter school. Maybe you did that. Maybe I'm going to assess him based on some other work that he has done or references that he gave me, whatever. But that's about as much as I need to trust him. After that, we'll figure things out legally if there's a problem. And so my depth of relationship with the person who I am in relationship with can remain extraordinarily shallow. Mm. And it's kind of like a relationship that is built on uh, uh, mutual benefit. I am only entering into this agreement with Sandy to be in some kind of relationship with him because I perceive that I am going to get the benefit of that relationship. The only reason that Sandy is willing to, to give me the quid pro quo of that relationship is because in his mind, he's the one who is benefiting from the relationship. And so he's getting paid, which is something that he wants, and that's a benefit to him. I am getting my room painted, which is a benefit to me. If I, that is not perceived in that way by the two parties as there being a mutual benefit in the arrangement, in the relationship, the relationship is over. I won't even call Sandy. If I don't want my room painted, I have no reason to call Sandy. A covenant is very, 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 very different than that. And what we have to begin to understand is what does a covenant look like? What does the heart of a covenant person actually look like, act like? Because until we understand that, chances are we would rate ourselves in our ability as a covenant person, very highly. It's amazing to me how highly I would rate myself as Tina's husband compared to how Tina would rate me as her husband. <laughs> how many of you say, I'll give myself better marks than Tina would give me, right? Okay, let's use somebody else. I know you don't, want, you don't want me to call you out. But how many of you know that that's how this works? We always rate ourselves better than we're actually doing. We want to give us, and matter of fact, then the converse part of that is I always rate Tina worse than she's actually doing. So I have this terrible way, this human terrible way, if I'm not careful of my covenant relationship, it's not long before they fall apart. Right. And that's what we see in our culture because uh, we don't understand how this thing works. If we understood how it worked, one, we'd have better relationships, particularly our married relationships because those are covenants. And can I prophesy to you, you'll have a better understanding of why stuff isn't working if it's not and how to get it to work once you want it to work because it isn't actually that hard. Okay, so number one, we need to start over. Don't think what we're gonna talk about is just gonna be adding on to what you think is a North, very successful North American culture. North American culture, as we'll talk about it in a minute, is not a covenant culture. Okay, we have zero, almost zero experience with covenants. Um, if we look at the marriage covenant, it will help us with the mechanics. What does the mechanics actually look like of how a covenant works? Okay, the first thing then, have I done a, enough of a preamble for you to get to, to know where we are? Okay, so we're gonna take, it, take a look at marriage 
and we're going to take a look at some of the things that are non-negotiables when it comes to marriage. Okay? How are you all ready for that? Are you all ready for what we're going to talk about? Okay. So when it comes to marriage, how many of you would say it is not negotiable that my mate forsakes all others? Would you say that, no, no, that's okay. I have one of these open marriage. And, you know, if you have all that, then that's not, that's not what you have, right? <laughs> Covenant relationships are, you ain't going, let me put it this way. You ain't going anywhere if you don't get this point. How many, of you would, how many wives would say, yep, I ain't marrying nobody that is confused about this point. Right, right. Isn't that true? Yes. Okay. When it comes to the issue of, do you all understand why it's important that all of your girlfriends, you take that little book that has all your girlfriend's name in it and you burn it before you get married, that your wife would expect that you'd burn it before you got married. How many of you say, yep, she did expect me to do that. Do you all understand why that is? Why is it necessary for you to have a monogamous, single focused relationship rather than uh, a plethora of relationships, all of them called something or other, right? We know there's every single person when they're getting married has always says, I expect there to be faithfulness in this marriage. Yes. I don't expect to find out that I come home one day and one of your ex-girlfriends is cooking you breakfast. If I, that does happen, guess where the frying pan's going? Is that, now this is, I, I want to draw the point here. Is there any debate at all ever? that single focus monogamy is an indispensable quality when it comes to relationships, particularly your covenant relationships. Can we all say yes? yes. I'm gonna keep going until I get every head to nod here. Because everybody knows I expect that, right? I expect that. Do, how many of you remember what the, this, uh, have you all, anybody ever read this thing called the 10 Commandments? Yes. Do you, anybody know what the first one is? Does anybody know? This is our new Protestant age. We don't read our Bibles anymore. The first commandment is, thou shall have no other gods before me. What is that talking about? Well, it, it goes on to talk about idols and things like that. You know, no little amulets and no little things. But what God is saying is, I'm looking for a monogamous relationship. Right? I'm not looking to share this relationship with, with that I, you and I have, you know, the bride of Christ relationship that we have. We're not looking to share that relationship with anybody. It's just me and you, God speaking. Now, eternally, God can say that to every single person. Uh, we are not eternal. We have one singular relationship with God. Yes. Right? So when we are looking for, am I actually functioning in a covenant position? I'm looking to discover, uh, do I have any other gods that are before God? Isn't that what, what you'd expect, right? I want to know. Is there, is, you know. is there somebody else in your, in your you know, speed dial that I need to know about when it comes to your relationship with God? When Jesus said this, when he's talking about it in the New Testament now, because this goes on to say that God is a jealous God, right? He does not want that term, jealous God, is referring to, I'm not looking for there be, to be any competition in your life. If you have some competition, if you haven't decided, like, you know, if I'm doing marriage count or pre-marriage counseling for somebody and the guy comes to me and he says, you know what, I'm just super struggling because I really love my betrothed person, but I really have feelings for my ex-girlfriend too. What, do you know what I do? What do you do in that situation? Right? He says, you know that date you picked? That's not the date. Because until you make that decision, there's, there's only one person is going to win at the altar. There's not going to be, you cannot have this. Is it, wouldn't you do that? I'm not being a mean pastor here, but wouldn't you do that? Where you say, you know what? No, you have to settle this issue. Who is going to be your God as you begin to move forward, right? And you settle that. Well, in the New Testament terms now, so this is going to be the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus says, you cannot serve what? God and mammon, right? And so we have this drawing in now where Jesus is kind of repeating, but making more specific, 
the problem that we are going to face when it comes to having a relationship with God. And he simply says, you cannot have God as your God and serve mammon. You just can't do that. It's not going to work. Now consider the way our culture works when it comes to this thing called mammon. Mammon is probably better for us to define it as money and power, where God says, if you want to come into the kingdom, you know your old girlfriend? Yeah, yeah, she, no, 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 she can't come. No, 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 it's okay, she'll be quiet. No. No, she can't come. But most of us, we can't, we really don't even know how that works. We don't really understand that when we are trying to relate to God, for the most part, we're looking for the blessings. We're looking to see how we can sort of corner God into the right spot so that zippity doo dah blessings come in my way. It wasn't really a relationship with God I was looking for any, at all. I was looking for the blessing. I was looking for the power. I was looking for the ability. I was looking for the protection. You know, all the angels are gonna surround me and I'll be able to not even dash my foot against a stone. Yep, that's what I'm looking for because I really not into dashing my foot against any stone. And so all of those things now, because we like, and everybody was raised like this, we are just like, our superpower in our culture is how we serve mammon. And so when we come up in our culture, making a decision to step into the ways of God and into the kingdom of God become very problematic for us because we've fallen in love with our girlfriend and we really need our girlfriend really badly. And so when it comes to getting married, you know, we just don't want to throw that phone number away. And see, that's how God sees this. That's the problem, is that we're not faking out God when it comes to this secret relationship, if you will, that we have. You know, it's the unspoken, it's the un, you know, I won't really, I'm not really looking to admit that I have this relationship with mammon, but I'd rather serve mammon than I'd serve God, but I don't think mammon gives me eternity, so I'm going to try and have them both. And Jesus says, absolutely not. It does say in Luke chapter 12, though, that you are supposed to make friends with mammon. This becomes difficult for us. It is a good idea to make friends with mammon, but it's not a good idea to have uh, mammon as a god, because God will not have that. And so he expects that through your relationship with him, it does require you to have, you know, a relationship with money and power and all those things, a proper relationship, but not that you serve them. Does that make sense to everybody? And so as we go forward, understanding that we're already going to be in a really, really, really bad spot when it comes to a covenant relationship that is going to empower us to actually have the blessing of Abraham flowing in our lives. In the New Testament as well, it talks about that we are the bride of Christ. And so referring to all of us as, if you will, guys, it's, uh, some for, it's, maybe you have a hard time relating to this, but we are brides. And when you are a bride, you realize that upon you is the, the greater work of cha the, the, the chastity, you know, the, the keeping of yourself and being faithful and being relating to Jesus, your husband, as it were, in a very, very faithful way. That's what's drawn into this picture of being a faithful person. Uh, remember when Mary and Joseph were betrothed? That's in, uh, we would say engaged to be married. And it's found that Mary is with child. Uh, in that day, similar to this, there's really only one way you get to be with child. And Joseph had a, a problem with that. He was going to do what? He was going to put her out. I mean, quietly, respectfully, you know, he was a compassionate person, obviously, but nevertheless, we ain't doing this. Unless God would have interrupted him in a dream and shown him what the real status of the situation was, the expectancy in the day when this kind of stuff was written down for us, referring to somebody as a bride, really required the monogamous situation to be really clearly defined. So even in the New Testament, 
we can see that there's no debate about this. Where are you in your decision to serve God and serve money? Um, even when it comes to, in Matthew 19, you remember when Jesus was saying, you know, what, does it, what actually dissolves a marriage? And really the only thing that dissolves a marriage is unfaithfulness. If you don't have a monogamous relationship, you've got a, an extra person in the mix, and that, that, that's, not, that's not a marriage anymore. And so when we're able to be honest in the New Testament, in our culture, we're able to say, yeah, I need some real proof. I need some real evidence in my life that I have forsaken all others when I came into my relationship with God. And can I say, that's why this tithe and first fruit thing is so important to God. You know, because I've said it to God many, many times, and I would even love to do it even till today. I would like to get rid of the tithe and offering part of the service at all. And if, if, if it fails, then, you know, goody, I'll get to go do something else. Um, but he won't let me not do this. It's so important to God that every Sunday, all of his brides, as it were, come in and demonstrate, you know, God, you're still number one to me. Very good. You know, it's easy you know, if I could go back to the marriage relationship, it's easy for me to live a monogamous relationship if Tina and I live on a desert island all by ourselves. That's easy. How about when opportunity comes? How about when Tina ticks me off? Not that that ever happens. How about when uh, I'm just having a bad day? Right? You can have all of these times when now it becomes difficult to maintain a faithfulness in your relationship, right? It's like tithing and offering, right? God is always upping the game in your life. Always. Because he always wants you to come on Sunday morning and prove that you still serve him. As you up your game, your financial needs are higher. So, he has to bless you with more, but you're always, you're going to find yourself always, at least if my life is any example, you're always having to, every time there's, you have a little bit more, God uses a little bit more, which leaves you really believe in God for the end of every month. And when you can, when you get a little bit of cushion at the end of the month, you know what he tells you to do? Go do something else. And so there's always a reason to say, I can't do this. There's always a reason where you have to say, no, 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 I, I trust God, not mammon. And I'm bringing my tithe in, I'm bringing my first fruit in, and I'm saying every single time, God, I do not have, I'm never going to prioritize my relationship with this other God. If I run short, I run short. If I miss my this, I'm, I'm, I'm missing it. I'm just never going to betray that. Because I, you know, I would say to Tina, I says, I, I'm only going to be unfaithful on Tuesdays. Does that, how does that go? How many of you know unfaithful ever is unfaithful? Yes. Yep. How many of you know that? That's the same way God relates to our tithe and our offering, that, or our, our first fruits. Offering is up to you. Your tithe and your first fruits, God says, those are things that you separate out. And I'm not taking another offering. That's why I'm teaching this on Wednesday. You separate it out and it becomes holy, right. separated. Yeah. You don't even, in the olden days, you wouldn't even mix the tithe in with the other stuff. Yeah. It would go into a separate place. Yeah. They even referred to it as the accursed thing. Don't even touch it. It's like it's so precious. Don't touch that separate it off and put it over here. And then when the time comes, take it from there and give it to God. Other than that, don't look at it. Don't touch it. Don't smell it. Don't think about eating it. Don't do anything. That, that's, how, that's how God wanted it related to. God, is, God does not have a money problem that he needs your tithe. It's not the point. That's why I want to remove it from the service. If I had my way, I would remove it because it creates all of this weird situation in our culture 
when the whole atmosphere in the church goes, Bleh. why? But why? Because people serve mammon. That's why. God says, that's mine. You say, uh, no, I'm keeping it. And so, because of that, now we want to create a place where the, the kingdom has got to have the blessing of Abraham flowing. We cannot do the things we're being called to do if we're trying to do it the way we do it now. Right? It's, it's, it's got to have this place where we accelerate enormously when it comes to the blessings in our lives. Strength, finances, blessed in, blessed out, country, city, overflowing, head not the tail, enemies come one way, flee seven way, all of those things that are part of the way God intended our lives to be. The problem is so many people really haven't had that tear up the old note, the old black book experience and say, you know what, it's just me and God from now on. I'm choosing my one. I'm choosing my one and I'm not ever going back on that decision to choose my one. I think if we had that kind of a relationship at the very beginning of our season with God, it would dramatically change. You know, most Christians that I know would describe their first two weeks with the Lord as the best two weeks of their time as a Christian. That's like me saying to Tina, the best time I had with you was on our honeymoon. What would happen next if I ever said that? Right? It's not true. Thank goodness it's not true. But that's what I would be saying. Our relationship has gotten systematically worse since our honeymoon. That's what we would be saying if I said that. That's most Christians' experience. That their early season, their honeymoon season with God was their best season. Instead of looking at it and saying, no, no, that was just a great beginning and it has been flying high ever since which is what the experience will be when we can deal with this covenant issue, particularly when we can deal with the mammon issue and get over it. Get over it to the place where God can test us 30 times in a row and we will be faithful every, every time. He would have made it so much easier if he would have had the ministry equation without these elements. These are the, you go ask anybody that's building a modern church and they will tell you the big thing you gotta get out of your church is offerings. Don't do the offerings during the service because people don't want to talk about money in church. You know, I, I don't want to talk about my girlfriends when I talk to Tina either. <laughs> I don't have any girlfriends, but I have a ton of girlfriends. And I have, very good, very good. But none of them in that way. Yeah. Um, Malachi chapter 3 was written to bring correction to the nation and them not tithing was part of that correction, saying, uh, you are robbing me. God's saying, that's mine. That is my possession. That is something that as a covenant partner of mine, you have committed to give me the tithe. That's mine. That's kind of what he's saying, right? As part of the covenant relationship, Tina expects, I am not going there. Tina expects a tithe from Ian. Can you understand what I'm trying to say to you there in this G-rated program, right? Every Sunday, he celebrates the people who without hesitation say, we serve God, not mammon, and are willing to demonstrate with that increase that has been given to them. That not only to give the tithe, but to give the tithe in a celebratory way so that this is kind of like this is the proof, God, right here, that I, have been, that I am faithful to you and not mammon. God knows the situation that could have used that money in your life. God knows the your next door neighbor just got a new thingamajig and you could really like one of those new thingamajigs and your tithe would probably have bought you just about what he got. Instead of that, you brought that to God and say, no, 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 God, we're not, I'm not looking at those things. I'm, my faithfulness is with you. And this is all you ask for my faithfulness is a first fruit once a year and a tithe once a week. That's all you're asking from me to, for me to prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am your covenant partner and that there are no other gods before you. 
That's all that this is going to take? Deal. Deal. Uh, and we'll close. Let me just see if I can close here. Yes. God is always, I've already said that. God is always leading you into bigger and more expensive assignments because he always wants you to be depending on him for your finances. He knows that we can get up to a place where we're at kind of comfortable and we kind of get everything organized so that it's comfortable at that level. And then we can just sort of coast. We don't really need God for it anymore because we have the faith we need in order to make that level work. And what does God do? God calls us to another level where we need to believe God. We need to be pressing in to, to our relationship with God in financial things constantly. That's because he wants this constant place where we are not be slipping slowly but surely back into the grasps of mammon, which is what happens. I watch it, I've watched it literally in almost every Christian I have known ever that does that. The blessing of God starts to appear in their life. They're faithful. They tithe. They're, they're diligent. They start to work. The blessing starts to happen. Now their tithe check goes from a dollar to a hundred dollars. They out. Because now that's we're now we're talking real money, right? And uh, that, but you see that's what God does it for. God does it so that He has this place where you know, and that you are constantly challenged to say. I am in covenant with Almighty God. This is the term of my covenant. For me to betray this means I am nullifying from my perspective. It never nullifies from God's perspective. God's been in covenant with you since the day Jesus was on the cross. You just never knew that. We step into that covenant when we make the decision, right? I've made the decision to enter into covenant with Tina. When I make the decision to come into covenant with Almighty God, God says, hey, you're welcome and you're all welcome. Mm -hmm. But you need to understand, I will not have, I won't, I, I'm not going to share you with somebody else, God speaking. You need to step in and be stepped in, right? Uh, okay, that's good. We can, we can finish this off next time if you come back. The... Um, <laughs> The key to this is, is understanding. I, I'm not trying to get your tithe. I mean, I am trying to get your tithe. You know, Malachi tells me I'm the person that they're yelling at in the book of Malachi because I'm the priest that they were telling that, why are you robbing me? The, he was talking to the priest because the priest didn't have the guts to institute the laws of God, which was oh. part, and the tithe was a big part of that. And many people in our culture, or many people in my position are saying, you know what, we're getting rid of that part because it's going to goof everything up. We'll figure out another business model in order to make this work. I'd like to do the same thing. I've told you that. The problem is, when it comes to us relating to money, this is serious business with God. Can I tell you, the devil would almost let you have any revelation out of the Bible except deliverance from mammon because of what it's going to do. Because deliverance from mammon, if you go back to the, to the list of Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 13 there, you get everything else. You get healing, you get success, you get protection, you get power, you get uh, all of the benefits if we just can get beyond this either not tithing or tithing in order to get the blessing. You don't want to do either one of those. I'm not nice to Tina because I get benefits for being nice. Often. Sometimes I'm just nice because it's my job to be nice. That's my covenant decision with her is I'm going to look after you. I'll do the very best to take care of you all the days of my life. Right? So when we get into those boats where we have Christian who doesn't tithe, I'm not sure what that person is, but let's say there's a person who goes to church who doesn't tithe. Can I tell you, if you go to church and you don't tithe, you're just dating God. You don't have an actual marriage yet. Matter of fact, you're not even dating exclusively. I know that's hard. But when we relate it to the way we are in a marriage, if I don't have a faithful monogamous relationship with Tina, I'm just dating. We're just having coffee. When I'm ready, and don't do it till you're ready. But when you're ready to step into that place where you have, which we'll talk about next time. <clears throat> Marriage happens in a, in, a, in a sequence. You go from being friends in a group to friends, one, one, just you and them, 
then you have exclusive relationship. You step into a, okay, we're boyfriend and girlfriend now, right? And then you become betrothed, engaged, and then you become married. And how many of you know, because our culture is all whacked in all this, but <clears throat> certain, you get certain extra benefits as you move along that road, right? And we get them all mixed up. People want the marriage stuff when they just dated, you know, when we just met 20 minutes ago, and now we want the marriage stuff. So it gets us confused, and young people are very confused in this area. But relationships are supposed to move along a, a, a kind of like a stepping process. That's how God wants us to relate to him. When people come to church here for the first time, God's looking to begin to talk to them, have a date. He wants to hang out. He wants you to experience his presence. He wants you to experience his goodness. He wants you to experience what it means to be loved, cared about. And he's okay with that. He doesn't need you to make a commitment yet. Then as you go along a little bit, then he's going to say, okay, can we up our game a little bit? Would you read your Bible every day? Would you pray? Would you see if God will talk to you? And you kind of have more of, an, more of an intimate relationship with him. Nothing crazy yet, but it's kind of a little bit more of an intimate time when you have private time in your bedroom with another person, God. And then slowly out of that, you prove each other, you trust each other, you, can I do this, you know? How, is God going to be faithful? Am I going to be able to be faithful? You know, am I... All of these things kind of go after a while, then you're betrothed, and now it's the time. This is business now, right? The next step is we're in. So during your engaged years, you're kind of, you know, let's look at, let's go tile a floor together. Let's see how we do. <laughs> how about if we can figure out to do a jigsaw puzzle together and I'll hide a piece and see how you handle that. <laughs> right? Let's go, let's travel somewhere in a car for 10 hours. <laughs> you're driving. Let's see how that goes. Let's have, uh, let me order a pizza that's got nine slices. <laughs> let's see how that goes. Isn't that what you're interested in finding out? Who's going to get the last piece of pizza? Right? Isn't that what you're interested in that season? Yes. That's okay that you do that with God. And then when it finally comes down, when you said, okay, now I want the blessings, you know, the ones I'm talking about. <laughs> then she says, okay, you know, what, what's the song? Julia, what's the song? Should right? Should you should have put a ring on it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Is that's right there. That's what is, you know, isn't that, isn't that, sorry. It's not your song. It's the first time I ever heard that song. Julia was doing it right up here. And I loved it because it was such a great song, right? If you want this, then you need to put a ring on it, right? I was just such a good message to our, to our culture, you know? Should I have put one of those warnings up? This is a, uh, you know, adult only service. You see, what happens is, is if when you're getting closer to that day when you're saying, I'm going to make a covenant, I am supposed to be really mature about that decision. These are the promises. I make vows to Tina. I said these particular things. Those weren't vows to get to the next phase. Those were promises that I made to her. Promises that she made to me. Those were like, real. Now I count on her to fulfill her side of that. She counts on me to fulfill my side. If all that I, all I, now for the rest of her life, she has to go and check out, just creep my phone every two days to see if I'm being faithful or not, right? That's not going to work, right? It's just, it's going to destroy everything if that's the case. If I have to have passwords on everything that I have, I, I don't deserve to be in a relationship. So I'm proving that I'm not trustworthy, Understand? I'm not saying don't password protect your stuff, but if she asks you for the codes, give them to her, right? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You see how complicated this is? It's not children land. It's mature people land. It's making the decision that it's legit. God, if you're going to get into covenant with God, he wants to know, are you mature? Are you ready for this? I know you want the, everybody wants the blessings. You can get the nastiest person on the planet and ask them if you'd like a free cup of coffee and he'll say yes. That's not the point. The point of the matter is, am I really ready to make a big person decision and enter into covenant with Almighty God? Because I love him, because I trust him, 
because he's proven himself faithful to me, because we've walked a ways together and I have decided, like my relationship with Tina, I am not willing to live the rest of my life, not a moment more, without her. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to have a covenant. Better off on your own, right? I don't want to take, I, I, I want to give my life to serve her life. That's what a covenant is. Does that make sense? Yes. Now what we have to do, we've all walked this way a long time with the Lord, many of us, but many of us now have to go back and look and see, hmm, is that what I did? Or did I get fire insurance? You know, so close your eyes for a moment as we just close. Sorry, I'm running late tonight, but I'm not sorry I'm running late. I want you to be blessed. Can I tell you something? The whole point of victory is lost if you don't get blessed. Because we're building a church that's going to change the world. We're building a church that's going to last a thousand years. Unless we have the blessing of God that's going to empower us to do some of those things that we talk so boldly about, then you know what? You're just a sounding gong. You're just, wow. you're just blowing air. We have to be ready as the people of God to do what it takes in order to man up to get done what needs to get done in our world. And this is part of it. I'm sorry if you're offended at me, and I'm not sorry again that you're offended at me, but I wish you weren't offended at me if you are. So just... Take a, take a little moment with the Lord and just ask him, like, Lord, is there evidence in my life that I have removed mammon from my love list? When I married you, when I came into covenant, was I really ready to be faithful to you? to give up all the things I had learned about manipulating the world of mammon and all of those things, serving mammon, living my life in order to get the things of this world. Is there really a lot of evidence that would suggest that I don't need to revisit this? Or perhaps are we all in a place where I'm talking about this today because... We have to step over the broom, as it were, again. We have to really consider. If, you know, in a marriage context, we would say we had to renew our vows. When there's a challenge in my life, I'm not going to go to the world. I'm not going to go to mammon in order to solve my problem. I'm going to go to my spouse, as it were, spiritual spouse, which is God. I'm going to learn how to put him in first place. When it comes to my tithe and my first fruit, am I done with the mammon pressure of those things? Can I say, am I ready to say, or how do I get to be in readiness to say, I'm entering this covenant with you, almighty God, and your portion will never be withheld from you. My expression of my faithfulness will never be withheld from you. Am I willing to enter a monogamous relationship with almighty God? You know, I have this practice when I marry someone, I mean, as a, I'm married to her, but I, you know, such is the problem with the English language. When I perform a marriage, I always go to both the bride privately, with her chambermaids, of course, but, and then to her, to the man, and I always say to them, I says, you know, I, my car is right outside. I'll make an excuse why you had to go, but if you have any doubts about the decision that you are going to make, this is the time to put it off. Don't worry, I'll explain to everybody. We'll still eat the food. We'll, I'll explain to everybody. But don't do this because you feel you should. Or there's some kind of, you know, party pressure that gets you into this when you're feeling on the inside of you that you need to go. 
I will zip you out the back door and I'll get you home before lickety split and I'll tell everybody that you didn't feel good. And we'll have to do this another time. I do that with every single person. They get mad at me sometimes that I do that because covenant's very important to me. I know it's the only life-giving relationship style in the world. And you can't do marriage without a covenant. Can I tell you? Christianity is the same thing. You cannot do Christianity without a covenant. And you can't do covenant with God without dealing with mammon. So I'm not going to pressure you, but I'm going to pray with you. Put your hand over your heart. And you really want to mean this. You really want, and if, you, and if you don't mean it, then move your mouth, but don't say nothing. That way nobody will know. I, I, I'm, I'm really being serious in the sense that it's good that if you really don't feel that you can pray and commit to God to serve him and not mammon, to tithe and never not tithe, to first fruit and never not first fruit, sometimes those are big decisions. You just have to wait. That's okay. God's okay with you waiting. Because he really does want people, like in Mark chapter 4, to them that are within and to them that are without. God was okay with the people who were still without, not really ready to come to within yet. And so don't feel like I'm pressuring you to do this or there's some kind of, uh, this is a secret plan I have. Don't do that. Uh, My secret plan, I do have a secret plan. My secret plan is I want the blessing of Abraham flowing in your life. I want us to get to the place where we can finally get ourselves off our minds. And the only way you get yourself off your mind is to get the blessing of God flowing in your life. So you can finally not worry about all of your stuff. And you can take a moment every day, maybe two seconds, when you can think about somebody else. That's what my secret plan is. So, you know, this is not doable. The Word of God is what reveals to us His nature. And everything that you're saying is virtually, it's not a mental thing that we're doing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a heart thing. And the Bible, we use terms that the Bible says, you know, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And we can repeat all of these things, but we want that supernatural life. Yeah. And when pressure comes, we will cave in under the pressure which is what you're saying, Mm -hmm. if we don't know him. And the only way that we grow in relationship and we grow in life in a manner that pleases the Lord is that we do it by faith, that we allow his Mm -hmm. word, not ritualistically or legally, but to reveal his nature. His word and getting in his word is paramount to what you're saying today because it's revealing to us without us even knowing what the word is supernaturally doing inside of us. It's supernaturally helping us when pressure comes to not um, forsake him, yeah. to not go another way, to not, when, when pressure is facing you with a, with, with a sickness or with finances and They're literally looking at you and saying, there's no other way. Or they're giving you a diagnosis in an area of life that, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do about your money. There's nothing we can do about health. And the only way you're going to bypass that, the only way you are going to bypass that is if you trust what God's saying over what they're saying. And that's pressure. And the only way, the only way you overcome that pressure is the word of God. Yeah. It is everything to us not forsaking him yeah. and going another way. There yeah. is no <coughs> other way to do this and be faithful to God apart from his word because yeah. that is his nature. Yeah. And that's what we kind of, that's why God, I think we have to rebuild the way we do this, Christ, the entrance into Christianity. It needs to be something that's a lot less imposed. You know, like even as we kind of go from here to think about what's in my mind as we do Buffalo and all these type of things that I really want people to be able to come in because it's their willful desire to understand this is what the relationship is about. 
And are you wanting that kind of a relationship, right? Or do you just want us to serve you forever and come and we'll take care of you? That's good too. We need people to serve. Then there's another group of people that want to come in to say, no, no, I want a relationship with this God. I want to be, me and him, I want exclusivity with him. Then I want to be married with him. Does that make sense to everybody? And I think if we could do that that way, even as we make a decision today to pray, if we do it that way, I think we're going to end up with people who are really more, the, you see, the problem that we have in our culture is we'll promise people the blessing. Mm. We didn't tell them that you had to do this, this, and this. Because we don't, we want to say the good news, we don't want to say the challenging stuff, Right? But instead of that, if I tell you you want to be a doctor, it's going to take you 12 years of your life. Do you still want to be a doctor? Right? That's how the world works. Right? You want to have a car? Good. You want to pay the insurance? You want to pay the gas? You want to make the payment? Right? Everybody wants the car. It's the other stuff we don't want. Right? That's the same way we need to look at our relationship with God so that when it comes time for us to fulfill our part of the covenant, we don't break the covenant and then get mad at God because he's not fulfilling his side of the covenant, which is what we do all the time. We'll talk about that next time. But being able to really see why doesn't the covenant in the, in the expression of the blessing of God, why doesn't it work in our lives as well as it should? And then we can clearly see when you look at it a little bit, we go, okay, yeah, well, there it is. That's why the frying pan is in the back of my head. I didn't know I couldn't do that, that, and that. No, you should have learned that before you got into the covenant, right? Wasn't that what you say that, women? Wouldn't you say you should have learned that one? Right? Put your hand. So listen, you have to, let's go back to this big decision that each one of us, if we're ready to make it, you know, where we didn't understand that the tithe and the first fruit, that serving God and not mammon, seeing the word of God as our future, as our success, rather than all of these natural things that we've concocted over the years. We don't want to let those go because that's where our strength comes from. That's where our provision comes from. That's where our protection comes from. And God just sees that as unfaithfulness. And so if you're ready and you feel this is just the Holy Spirit wants you to do, just pray this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I know that my relationship with you through Jesus is a covenant relationship. That he went to the cross in order to open the door for us to have a marriage relationship, a covenant relationship. And Lord, you said that my relationship with mammon had to end before I get into covenant with you. And I didn't know that. I didn't even understand how to do that. And so, Lord, I ask your forgiveness where I have had other gods before you, where I have served mammon because I needed mammon instead of serving you, because I needed you. And Lord, I know that that was unfaithfulness on my part and closed the door to our covenant. And so, Lord, I'm asking you for forgiveness. You know, if there's somebody in a marriage that's unfaithful, it doesn't have to end the marriage. But if you repent and you allow the marriage to be restored, it can be put back together again. That's kind of what we're asking the Lord. It's kind of a little graphic for me, but it's kind of what we're asking the Lord to do where we've been unfaithful and we've asked for his forgiveness. We're repenting, changing our mind, We're renewing our mind with understanding of what this really means to be in relationship with God. And forgiveness requires the repentance. It requires a sincerity.
And so say, Lord, am I forgiven? And just let the Lord talk to you about that because you want that relationship to be restored. So say, Lord, I know because I am forgiven and because I am sincere, I know that my relationship with you, my covenant relationship, has been restored. From this moment forward, you are my God, and I will have no other gods before you. No matter where this goes, I'm not turning my back on you ever again. Now, don't pray this prayer about the tithe part unless you, it's sincere in you. Just skip it if you're not ready to make that decision. So say, Lord, the evidence that I'm serving you and not serving mammon will be forever evidenced by my tithe and my first fruit. You've said that those things are yours. They are what you require as the expression of my faithfulness. And so, Lord, I'm making a promise to you, a vow to you, that I will not break, that I will bring the tithe and bring the first fruit as long as I live, till death do us part. You know, that sounds really like it's almost crazy to say those type of things where you're, but you know, when you're, when you're, when you're making a vow to your spouse, those are the kind of vows that you make. You make these till death do us part kind of vows. And so if you made that, or if you couldn't make it, that's okay too. But if you, made, if you couldn't make that vow, then you want to go home and you want to say, you know what, God, I think I've been kind of pretending in this whole covenant thing. And go and figure that thing out with God. And when the time comes that you're ready to do that, do it very intentionally. Make the decision like that, that's saying, okay, God, I'm ready to come in. I understand I'm a big boy, I'm a big girl. I'm ready to come in and I'm ready to do my part to put you in that number one place in my life. You know, number one is more than, me putting Tina number one is more than my physical faithfulness. How many of you know that? Physical faithfulness is just an expression of that that should go into every corner of my existence, that she's number one primo ballerina in my life. Isn't that true? Same with God. This tithe first fruit thing is just the beginning where you demonstrate your faithfulness, but serving God has a much broader scope in your life. And that's the life that we're all saying that we want. I want a life with Almighty God.